Jesus, we thank you this morning again. Every Sunday morning, Lord, we come in and we give thanks, Lord, that our thanks is just really not enough sometimes. But we thank you, Lord. We just pray for your service today. We pray for the worship. We pray for the word that we're going to hear today, Lord. Just open our minds and our hearts to hear what you have to tell us today, Jesus. And we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, northern. Yeah, northern. 
and impress them on their children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. See, in the Christian's home, it's always going to point back to Jesus. They can do their very best. They can give their very best. But everything that we do ought to honor Him. And what happens in the house is we represent as a model for our kids. When we do it, it's funny that they'll raise up to want to do it as well. Why? Because every son wants to be like their father. And most of the time, every daughter wants to be like their mother. Nick and Serena, they, they love God with every ounce and fiber of your energy. And I'll teach Ezra to do the same. And as you love God and each other, like I said, you will model before Ezra a wonderful love for God that he will want for himself. Why? Because love is attractive. Nick and Serena, by coming forward before God and his people, you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your son to the Lord. If so, respond by saying we do. All right. Serena, if you'd hand Nick to Ezra. <coughs> Nick, as you hold Ezra, I want you to feel the weight of it. In the same way that you feel his heaviness now, you have the responsibility to carry the weight of responsibility as a spiritual leader of your household. And not just an earthly father, but your spiritual father for it. And he'll look to you for guidance, and he'll look to you for understanding as he begins to learn about the Lord. The book of Ephesians teaches us about Christian households. Ephesians 5 teaches us that husbands are the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And husbands should love their wife, as Christ loved the church and was willing to lay his life down for you. And I know you, you're willing to do that. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. God's instruction on family leadership is very clear. Now, Nick, the ultimate responsibility it lands on the dad. It lands on his shoulders. And as the dad, you cannot lead anyone in a direction that you're not going. The champion of any cause is always the most motivated, the committed, and the most dedicated. And if you're going to be the spiritual champion of this family, you'll have to take on all those characteristics. Having come freely, I ask you, I ask now that you enter into the following commitment in the presence of God and his people. So that Ezra may walk in abundant life that Christ offers. And so do you, Nick and Serena, vow by God's help and in partnership with this church to provide Ezra a Christian home of love and peace, to raise him in truth of our Lord's instruction and discipline, and encourage him to one day trust Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord. If so, say we do. Now, family, you have a responsibility in this too. Modeling this kind of love cannot be done alone. It requires the help of others. And for this reason, Nick and Serena call upon the help of you as their family. And I now direct my questions to the family by coming forward before God and his people do you hereby declare your desire to help Nick and Serena fulfill the vow they have just made? If so, please respond by saying we do. Yeah. All right, church. The parents have made a commitment. And the family has made a commitment. But we're a family here as well. We're a body together. And so I asked the church to make a vow as well. Nick and Serena have the first responsibility. But they need the help and the support of the church. So I direct my questions to you by saying... By uh, being present in God's house today, do you hereby, first of all, declare uh, yourselves to be the children of God because you trust in Christ Jesus alone uh, for the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life? If this is true, congregation, please say we do. We do. Do you vow by God's help to be faithful in your calling as members of the body of Christ to help Nick and Serena be faithful to God and to help teach and train Ezra in the ways of the Lord, so that he might one day trust in him as Savior and Lord. If you accept this responsibility as the body of Christ, would you say we do? Amen. Let's pray for them. Amen. God, we love you, and we thank you that Nick and Serena have come forward, God, making a commitment to you, saying they are going to honor uh, raising Ezra in your way, God, and they're going to put him in your hands to do what you want to do with him, Lord, raise him up to be a mighty man of God, help him to be a world changer, a difference maker and a risk taker, God. Give him help in good days, God. Help him to love you with such passion, God, that others would see him and be ignited with the same fire, God. Help him to be a leader in his family. Help him to maybe even right wrongs that generations before may have not done before. Help him to be a leader in his school one day. 
Help him to be a leader in his church one day, God. And I pray that everything that he does, God, that you would get the glory of it. Just like Samuel was dedicated to you at a young age, God, and made a great difference in all Israel. Help us to do the same, God. Help him to make a difference, Lord. And help him to be a blessing to his parents, God. Help him to be, the, help him to be a, a child that always brings smiles, God, and not tears. Who brings truth, God, and not lies. And Lord, who brings just the reality of how much you bless them to their life, God. So in everything they do, God, help them to be an example of him as he becomes of age, God, so that he can be an example of others. Thank you for him today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. And you give this family a hand.
see you give the band a hand this morning. I'm glad you're here. You can be anywhere, but you're here this morning, so you might as well buckle up and enjoy the ride. Amen. So, you know what I, what I, what I was thinking about this morning? We had the baby dedication. We had all these things. And I thought about this. I would hate one day to know that I taught my kids or I coached my kids how to play ball well or how to, or how to do some skill, but I didn't teach them how to worship and I didn't teach them how to pray. I'd hate to know that I gave my whole life to something that didn't mean anything just for them to inherit nothing. You get what I'm saying? And man, fathers, we leave a legacy. We set the pulse of our kids' passions by how we live and how we walk before the Lord. Elijah may choose one day. Hosanna may choose one day not to follow the Lord. They may choose it, but they won't choose it because I'm not doing it. He may not, he may not worship as passionately as I do. He may not pray as much as I do. He may not read his word, but it won't be because I'm not doing it. Because I'm going to set the pulse. I'm going to set the pace. I'm going to set the standard in our house for what it's going to be. And April does the same thing every day. And I watch it day after day after day. And let me tell you, the grind is tough sometimes, but the reward is definitely without cost. I mean, it's without price. It's because you can't put a price on it. What you get in return is going to be so much greater. How you teach your kids, how you lead your kids. I don't want Elijah to be timid in his worship. I don't want him to be timid in his prayer. He may need that. It may be the only thing that sustains him one day. He may run into something that's too tough for daddy to handle. It may be something that I can't do for him. And you know what? If he remembers what dad did, he'll remember who dad meant to. And it's important, men of God, to get fired up about the right things. I think all the things are good. I love to watch Elijah play baseball. I love to watch him play football. I love all of those things, just like every red-blooded American dad does. But I want to see him lead a movement of people passionate about Christ. That's what I've given my life to. If I wasn't a preacher, I'd still want to lead a movement of people to Jesus. And uh, I'm excited about it, and I love it, and I love being here. And I love to get to be part of what God's doing. Uh, how many of you ever served in youth ministry before? Been a leader? Well, that's fine, ain't it? <laughs> Sometimes. I served in youth, youth ministry. I, I told several of you, but some of you are new. Uh, for 12 years, I was kind of like the, the second man, uh, not the leader, but, but doing a lot of the leading. And uh, once we carried a group of kids to uh, Atlanta, another great place to carry kids to. Um, we carried a group to Atlanta for an evangelism conference called Dare to Share. Anybody ever been to Dare to Share before? Me and April, Jason, and George. Okay, there we go. There's a few of us that. Dare to Share is an awesome thing. It tells you how to share the gospel using gospel acronym. You know, God created us to be with Him. Our sins separated us from Him. Going on down. It's a really neat thing. It fires, it fires our youth up every time we went. And I think we carried, I don't know, maybe, maybe about 40 kids, 30 kids. I remember we had a, a bunch of 15 pastor vans, it seemed like, because I was right on the And, um, but what I know about this is when you take youth somewhere, if you don't plan ahead every little step, you're going to fall and it's going to be bad. Okay? Especially in the Department of Food. you got to know what you're going to eat because why? Everybody gets hungry, right? You can't plan anything and not know where you're going to eat. If you don't plan where you're going with teens, it's like you, you're going to run into a problem. And so normally what we would do was we would, we would go to, we would get there on Friday night, we would go to the conference. And then the next morning, uh, I mean, that, that evening when the conference was over, we would run pizza back at the room. Why? Because that's safe to keep kids confined to spaces. Don't let them run free. That's never a good plan. They're not free range. It's a bad idea. And so what we did, we, we got them all in the room, we ordered pizza. That was normally how we handled things. But for some reason this time, we decided to do something differently. And by we, I mean the pastor, not myself. Because I don't think I would have done this. We said, there's a McDonald's down the street. Let's walk the kids down there and we'll let them go to this McDonald's. Walk the kids at 10 o'clock at night down the street in downtown Atlanta. <laughs> yes, it went about as good as, as, you, as you're laughing now. And so we go down the street, and as we're going down the street, some of the locals uh, who do not have homes are, 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 are out there, and they're uh, beginning to talk to us, you know, trying to ask us for money. Some trying to tell us to give them money, um, you know, because it's not always asking. Sometimes it's more of a demand. And so we finally get into McDonald's, and as we have all the kids in line in McDonald's, all the locals from outside have come inside, and our kids are standing in line, and they're just constantly just pounding, hey, can I get, can I get some money? Can I get this? Can I get, can I get, hey, you know, doing like really wild things. I mean, it, it was just a lot of chaos. And here I am, and I'm thinking, man, we're responsible for these 20, 30 kids. There's about three adults in there, and we're in downtown Atlanta, and now we 
you have all these uh, people hanging around just trying to harass the kids. And I'm like, this is just a bad, bad idea. And then I noticed, too, the next thing I noticed is not only are we standing in line, but the line's not really moving. And, I, and at McDonald's, you know, it's not quality, but, you know, you get something for your money, I guess. I, I never really understood the model because it, it's not like you wouldn't ever say McDonald's is the best hamburger around, but yet the line's always full. I don't really get that. I think they just they market good. Maybe people like clowns. I'm not really sure, but <laughs> sometimes I think we're the clowns a little bit by eating there. But um, but we're standing in line, and I'm like, why is the line not moving? This is after we're trying to move the locals along. Uh, along, and so I go up there, and I'm like, what's happening? And they said, oh, this McDonald's it doesn't serve hamburgers after 9 p.m. <laughs> what? We don't serve hamburgers. After what is the name of this place? It's McDonald's. What, we don't serve hamburgers. Well, what are we selling? Well, we sell uh, just, just chicken and fish, you know, after the service. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of our kids are trying to figure out what they want. Why? Because they've come to McDonald's expecting hamburgers, but now they're going to have to get chicken or fish. And that's really not McDonald's forte. If you don't think that the hamburger is good, let me tell you, the fish and the chicken really is struggling, okay? It's not the Chick-fil-A experience that you're wanting. And so, so I'm like, we don't serve hamburgers. I'm like, man, this is just ridiculous. I'm like, if you don't sell anything else, you want to sell hamburgers at McDonald's. If you shut down, you have to shut down the chicken and the fish after nine, okay? But let's keep the hamburger grill rolling. And I remember just thinking, how ridiculous is this? And then this is what I realized. As ridiculous as it is for McDonald's not to have hamburgers, it should be that ridiculous for us to be right, a gathering of God's people and not experience a move of God. We ought to come to church with an expectation that when we get here and we gather together that we're going to see the Holy Spirit of God come down and we ought to not really want to leave until it does happen. See, it's ridiculous for us to think people are going to be attracted to want to come here, but yet we never experience God's presence. What's attractive is the presence of God. Amen. Anything else is just a byproduct. And you and I are not that good. And so, uh, what, what, so uh, what is the problem here? What is the problem here? And so, look here, First Timothy chapter, uh, or Second Timothy chapter 3, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Such as hamburgers not being shared at McDonald's. And it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Look, this is the part that disturbs me. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So it says that we have a form of godliness, but it's godliness without power. That doesn't sound like a very much godliness at all. So, so what does a form of godliness do for me? Or what does it say? In other words, you look like God, but you don't have any of the power. What's the point? Who do I go to if I don't have the power? We're denying the power of Christ. We have our services. We have our meetings. And I've been to a bunch of them. But how many of us have ever been to a church service where you knew the Holy Spirit of God didn't show up, but no one else noticed? Because everything in the service could happen every week whether God showed up or not. I want to come with a hunger. Why? Because this, this thing that we're seeing, it's a form of godliness. In other words, it looks the part, but it lacks the power. I don't want that. I grew up in church. I don't like being places where the power is not. Why? Because I feel like it's a waste of my time. In my prayer this morning, I pray, God, don't let me waste my time. I don't want to come with time to be here. And the power is what changes people. It's what heals people. It's what sets them free from their endless pursuits of trying to obey laws and sets their heart on fire for, with the passion for a Savior. And the problem is many of us are living with the knowledge of Christ, but we live never knowing Christ. And we believe in Christ, yet we're not dwelling in Him. And so can I just start off this morning with some good news? If you would, turn to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Paul is writing to the church, but in Rome. And this is what he says. He says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is your good news this morning. Because through Christ Jesus.
Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin. For the, what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by what? The flesh. God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that righteous as in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us why, uh, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, for you are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of your sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him, of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. And what are we talking about today? I want to talk to you about being in Christ. Being in Christ. Being in something that surrounds you, and therefore you take on its identity. Being part of what God is doing. Verse 1 here, it says, you don't have to walk around like you're going to hell all the time. So quit walking around like you're condemned if you're in Christ, right? I've given my life to Him. It's telling us here in verse 3 that our flesh alone, or our willpower, is not capable of keeping God's law. Let's go back there to verse 3. I want you to see this. Verse 3, for what the law was powerless, powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to take on sin, uh, to, to be a sin offering. So what it's saying, it says, you know what, you're not capable of keeping the law. You can try to live by the law. You can try to live in the law. But what's going to happen is you're going to fall short. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're going to try. You're going to try to live up to that standard. But you alone in your flesh do not have the power to overcome sin in the flesh. You're going to constantly fall when you live based on a set of rules. What does it mean? It means that you can have freedom from sin. That you do not have to serve it. You do not have to walk in it. And you do not have to die because of it. But the only way that you're going to do that is to live in Christ. Because He is what gives us the power to overcome the flesh. So, Pastor, you're saying this morning, you're saying, I don't have the ability not to sin, so I can just keep doing the things I'm doing because Christ paid for it all. That is not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying you don't have the ability to not sin, but when you are in Christ, it empowers you to do everything that He did, and He overcame sin. He says, not only will you do what I did, He says, you'll do great things. the Bible, when we read the New Testament, when you're reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're looking at all the things that Jesus did, do you ever think, man, I can do more than what he did? He said, you will do more than I did. More. So sometimes I feel like we're living to a standard of less. And so, what does it mean that, that to live in him? It means that you've got to live in the Spirit. Those who are living a life after the Spirit are under what? God's guidance. And those, their mind uh, is on the things of the Spirit. They think of, relish, and love things invisible. They love things eternal. And the things which the Spirit hath revealed, which He works in us, moves us to and promises to give us. It says, you know, it's like they're planted in the Lord. You remember uh, Psalm chapter 1 talks about those who are in the Lord are like they're planted. They're like, they're like trees planted by a stream that don't wither and die, but they bloom in due season. That's what it's like. We're planted in the Lord, and wherever you're planted will determine your fruitfulness. It will. You get planted with the wrong people, and the fruit you produce will be pretty rotten. You get planted with the wrong people and your attitude will be rotten. Because wherever you plant yourself, that's what you bloom up and bring out fruit. I planted a garden this year. I 
I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I planted a garden this year. I think I had one plant that produced fruit and it wasn't in the place that I planted that one. <laughs> it's kind of like a side thought. I'll plant this over here and see what happens. Anyway, I didn't produce anything other than a waste of time. And after a while, I didn't care. I just watched it grow up. I was like, I don't care. I'm not, I'll go buy them. You know? But what happens is you get whatever you're planted in. The soil that I planted in was hard. It was, it was clay-like, and I didn't do anything to really prepare it. I just kind of put the plants there, and it gave them some water, and then they got too much water because it rained a bunch. And, and they just they, they, they had peppers that were like this long. I think they're supposed to be that long. You know, and so I, I, I'm reaping from where I planted my stuff. And what I'm saying is a lot of times in our life when we're looking around and we're saying, why is my life so miserable? Why am I so depressed? Why do I live in fear? Why do I keep falling to temptation? Why do I keep doing the things I'm doing? It's because you're living out where you've planted yourself. And if you'll plant yourself in Christ, you'll reap the things that he says, peace, patience, joy. These are the fruits of the Spirit. It's nothing that you had to work for. It's just when you're planted in him, these are the things that are naturally produced. Amen? Amen. I'm not alone, am I, this morning? Wherever we plant ourselves, we reap what we plant. All right, look here uh, at verses 5, um, 5 through 8. What I want you to see here, it says, those who live in the flesh, in other words, the ones who are feeding the desires of their emotions, their thoughts and lusts, are not living according with the Spirit of God. If a man doesn't have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in him and governing him, none of him belongs to Christ. He is not a member of Christ, not a Christian, and not in a state of salvation. If you're looking at his life and he is living by his own desires, he is living to please his flesh, oh, it feels good, so this is what I'll do. He is not living in Christ, nor does he belong to Christ. He's living for his flesh. People with a mind of flesh have their thoughts and affections fixed on things that gratify their corrupt nature. Namely, on things visible and temporal on things of the earth, on pleasure of, number one, their sense, and on pleasure of their imagination. They have their mind on praises or riches. The mind governed by the flesh leads to death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. In other words, what you earn for your sin is death. That's what you're going to get. Just like when I go to my job tomorrow, what I earn will be my income. But, if I, but when I serve sin, I, I, it leads to death, and it sinks into me. And it's just what I naturally get because of what I naturally do. And as long as I live by what I want, those are the things that I'm going to get in return. The mind governed by the flesh is death. See here in Romans, though, Paul is not giving anyone a pass to sin. And what he's saying, he's not giving anyone a pass to sin. He's trying to give them a solution to it. And that's what I'm going to do this morning. Tell me if you'll live in Christ. You'll step over the things of the spirit. If you'll live in Christ, if you just get so close to him, so in love with him, so far about what he's doing, you'll walk past the things that you used to have to climb. You can see it all on your own. It's easy to do. Just do whatever you want. But you'll never overcome sin on your own. It's not possible. There's only one solution for it. It's through Christ. We need his power, not willpower, if we're going to find freedom from power. I mean freedom from sin either. We're going to need his power, not willpower. You're not strong enough to do it. You know, we give, we give these guidelines. We say, don't steal, don't kill, don't lie, don't do this, don't do this. It's to help you. But the reality is, is if you'll fall in love with Jesus, you won't do those things. Why? Because you'll reap the fruit of where you're planted. Amen. You'll get in him. I loved it when Matt Rogers was here and he said, I drink as much as I want from knowing. I smoke as much as I want from knowing. Why? Because the habits that I used to have, God even changed my desire for those habits because I got planted in Him. And He doesn't desire those things, so I don't either. We need His power, not willpower. Look here in John chapter 6, verse 63. Jesus explains it like this. He says, the Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. And you say, man, my life just stinks. Well, why don't you get in Him? Because He says, what I'm giving you is going to give you life and it's going to give you peace. And you say, I never have peace. Well, do you ever have Him? 
And I'm not talking about chasing church. I'm talking about Jesus. The latter uh, on this, Paul echoes the same message to the Corinthians. Look here, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. God is the one who made us preachers of a new way of worship. This new way of worship is not of the law. It's of the Holy Spirit. The law brings death. Why? Because we can't keep it. But the Holy Spirit gives life. The law gives death. Why? Because I can't live up to it. I try. But only in Christ am I able to succeed. But the Spirit, it gives me life. Why does the law bring death? Number one, if we look at Romans 3, the wages of sin is death. Death is what you reap from a life of sin. And it's not just an earthly death. It's an eternal separation from God. And see, it's the thing about sin is it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a dead man. You ever seen Weekend at Bernie's? <laughs> when we live in sin, that's what it's like. <coughs> Bernie couldn't do nothing on his own, right? They had him up there skiing, but I don't know how they did that. But he couldn't do anything on his own. It's why? Because he was a dead person. That's what sin does to you. I want you, every time that you start to do something, you start to sin, I want you to think about Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> Yeah, they're just dragging you along. The church is just dragging you along. Why? Because you're not profitable to it when you're living in sin. It makes you a dead person. Dead people are of no profit to the kingdom of God. That is why Jesus had to deal sin its final blow so that we could have life in and through him. So number one, it's like you can't do it on your own. Number two, why does death, or why does the law bring death? Because you don't have the power on your own to keep it. Your fleshly nature is destined for death because it's rooted in sin. But when you are in Jesus, you are given life in the place of death. John 1, 5, 12 says, whoever has the Son has life. Well, I have life. So I have the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Now the issue here is the second part of this, which is, 1 John 5, 12, the second part B here, it says, whoever does not have the Son does not have life. And many people are walking dead, and there's no one around who loves them enough to tell them. They say they're in the church, but they don't look like Jesus. They say they're Christians, and yet the very definition says that means Christ-like, but they're not Christ-like. And they're walking dead. They're headed to an eternal destination that is not in heaven, that is not with Jesus. And nobody wants to tell them why, because I might offend them if I tell them the truth. Well, I tell you what, you might let them die if you don't. And I think offense is a little easier than death. Now, what, how do you do that? You've got to do that in love. You've got to do that the right way, because I can beat Elijah over the head with rules, or I can love him enough to discipline him. There's a difference. It's a gentle correction. Love is attractive. Condemnation is not. We have to love people to Jesus. Magnifying how in his love he has drawn them to repentance. Not listing their records of mess ups. Because let me tell you what. People who are messing up, they know they're messing up. There ain't no point you go out there and be in the story and tell them all what they've done in their whole life and how filthy they are and how terrible they are. You ain't getting nowhere with that. Why don't you tell them about the life they could have? You'll just fall in love with Jesus. You're fixing to have something you've never had. You're fixing to have hope when you've been hopeless. It doesn't matter what you've done before now. I'm telling you what you can do from now. Condemnation is not attractive. Most people are messed up and they know it. How do I know that? Because the devil, he's been working in condemnation for years. Revelation 12, 10 references the devil as the accuser of the brethren. And let me tell you, if you're wondering who the brethren is, it's you. He doesn't want good for you. He wants you, what, to die. Because the same death that awaits you as long as you live in sin is awaiting him. And so he's going to try to take as many with him as he can. And see, the, de the devil is not just bringing condemnation, but he's also bringing confusion to the body of Christ. That's why so many people are not living up to what the standard of God's word says. They're living some other gospel that they've, they've deemed acceptable. Many Christians are living lives that are full of sin, and they're abusing God's grace. The theory is infecting the church, saying you can live however you want, do whatever you want, and be whoever you want, and Christ will turn his head as long as you've prayed to receive salvation. 
And let me tell you the truth about this. This is, the, this is dangerous, and it makes a mockery of the price that Christ paid. We can't say we love him and hate his commandments. John 14, 23 and 24. Jesus said, the one who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love him. We will come to him and live with him. The one who does not love me does not obey my teaching. The teaching you are now hearing is not my teaching, but it is from my Father who sent me. Those who love me, they do what? They obey my teaching. Why? Because they want to be near me. Well, how do they obey my teaching? They live in me. And that word, that they're there for they're given the power to overcome anything that comes near them. Why? Because they're close enough to me where I can do anything. You know what? You, you know, you might you come up and you could you could easily maybe knock over one of my kids. But if they're next to me, I'd like to speak right. If he's out here and he's running away from me and somebody snatches him up, they might be able to do that. But let them really get him while he's next to me. That's what we're going to do. Because I'm going to get so close to him that you can't tell where I stop and he begins. And then, you know what? When tough times come, what will I do? I'll anchor him. Because sometimes he calms storms, and sometimes he calms his children. And the question for most, though, that I see is this, is they're struggling with sin. It's because what is your motivation? Can I tell you, you won't just wander up into a relationship with Christ. You won't just have to stay at some morning one day. Oh, I've got this great relationship with Jesus. I just know him so much. I haven't been looking for him, but I found him. It doesn't work like that. It's not a prayer, and it's not obeying a few commandments. It's a relationship with a living God that not only asks us to put all our trust in Him. Now, I want you to catch this. It's a relationship with a living God that not only asks us to put all our trust in Him, but invites us to, and then takes us to heights we've never imagined we could reach. See, sin doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a dead one. And Jesus doesn't make you a good person. He makes you a new one. Sin doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you dead. And Jesus doesn't make you a good person. He makes you a new one. And what? Look here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old is gone, and the new is here. Well, if that's true, then why are you tripping over your past? Let it go. <clears throat> Walk in Him. Walk with Him. Let Him make the adjustments. Let Him make the corrections. Why? Because the old me is gone, and the new me has come. If I'm a constant slave to my past, I think I need to ask myself, am I in Christ? Because if I'm in Christ, the new creation has come. Well, I should, maybe there may be struggle, but I can have victories. Because if I'm in Him, the old is gone, the new has come. But let me tell you, if you are in something, you've made a conscious move from where you were to where you are. You don't get into something by just hacking up on it. You've made a conscious move from where you are to where, from where you were to where you are. The old is gone, the new has come. And whatever you are in, oh, this is good. Whatever you're in surrounds you. Hold on. Whatever you're in surrounds you. This is this is for people who are weak and struggling this morning. Whatever you are in surrounds you. If I'm in a swimming pool, the water surrounds me. And if I'm in a Christ, he surrounds me. Like the water of the pool covers me, Christ covers me. And I become one with who he is. Because whatever I choose to be in surrounds me. That's why we sing that song. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Because I, when I choose to be in him, I get the protection of having his surroundings. I get the protection of having this covering, and I get the peace that comes with the attacks not coming at me, it's coming at us. So when, the, when I came to Christ, the old is gone, so I put off the old me. No way, I didn't just put away the old me, I put it to death. <laughs> Sin doesn't make me a bad person, makes me a dead one. Jesus doesn't make me a good person, he makes me a new one. So when I came to him, I didn't put the old one to the side so that I could pick it up later, I put it why? Because I was never coming back to it. I put it away. When I was a child, I thought I was a child, but when I became a man, I put my childish ways away so that I could follow Christ. So when I came to Christ, I put it to death. Look here, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with 
Christ, and yet I live not I, but Christ that lives within me. The life I live now, I live through him who gave his life for me. So now I have this life that I put the old me to death so that I can live in the power of Christ to, to take over anything that comes my way. Because it's not me that does it, but it's Christ that does it. So when something comes at me that's bigger than me, I say, oh, excuse me, I can't handle this, but let me tell you who can. Because let me tell you, I don't have every answer. I probably got less answers than you think. I pray, I ask God, He leads. I give you what I feel like the Lord says. But what I'm saying is, I don't have to have the answers because I have the one that does. Now, Christ must be in me and I must be in Him. John 15, remain in me. And as I also remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself. And God's not calling us to be faithful, He's calling us what? To be fruitful. And I must remain, and it must remain in the vine. It remains in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Not by me. Not near me. Unless you remain in me. In me means I'm connected to the source that's providing life. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me tell you, there is, no, there is no such thing as one world in the kingdom and one world in the world. Because as soon as you step out of the kingdom, you go to two feet. And you go on your way. And you do your own thing. And it's not like, well, I just sin a, I'm just sinning a little and I'm just doing all that part time. So I'm only partially effective for the kingdom. No, you're dead. You're not effective. But if you remain in the vine, you'll produce much fruit. Why am I not producing fruit? In my life for Christ. Why am I not seeing people come to Jesus? Why am I not seeing God restore things that have been dead? Is, are you in Him? Because near Him is not enough. When I remain in Him, the vine is the life source of the branches. He provides me with everything I need to bear much fruit. And when I'm in Him, the old me is gone and the new me has come. And that new me looks like what? It looks like who I'm in. My new me looks like Christ. Your old crowd may see you one day. Your old crowd may see you one day and they say, oh, there you are. There's that guy, remember? They may even reference you. Chris, I don't know, maybe you got some guys from back in the day that were friends with you when you went living for the Lord. They say, oh, there, there's Chris, man. I know Chris. I know how Chris is. I remember how he does. Oh, this is going to be good. Because on the outside, maybe you look the same. But let me tell you, let, let them wait. Let them wait for a minute. They may see Chris and say, oh, there's this thing over there. But let them wait. Let them wait until you open your mouth. Because once you open your mouth, what, what's in you is going to come out. And when they see what's in you, they'll know you're not going to use to Because what's inside finds its way out. And they may look at Cadre, they may say, oh, Cadre's the same old Cadre's, the same guy that's doing whatever back in the day. But then when he begins to talk, what happens? What's in you comes out of you. See, it's not I, but Christ who lives within me. If they see anything good, it's Christ who lives within me. Oh, just wait, wait until I open my mouth. Because then that relationship with Jesus that has, been, that has brought me to life, it's going to come forth. And so what I say, I say, keep on hanging around me, guys. Keep on. Hang here a little longer. Because if you'll just hang out with me, what's on the inside of me, it's going to come out and it's going to spill on you. And once you taste what I got, you know how to do this. Luke 6.45 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A lot of times we use this as a negative reference. We say, oh, there's nasty things coming out of your mouth and there must be nasty things in your heart. But what I'm saying this morning is the other side of that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Therefore, when you're out and you're walking in Jesus, the things that are coming out of your mouth, the things that are spewing from you are things of Jesus that bring what? Life and peace of life that's in Christ. When you talk, they begin to sound like Christ. And when I'm in Christ and He is in me, I can't help but reveal what's on the inside. Why? Because I don't act like I used to act. I don't talk like I used to talk. And I don't do what I once did. Not because of some rules that I'm following, but because the living God lives in me. And I don't want what I used to want. He didn't just 
has changed my habits. He changed my desires and my habits. And when I saw how much he loved me, when I saw the vastness of God's forgiveness, when I felt his mercy, when I should have received his judgment, I received his love, and I can no longer be the same. Why? Because once I felt it, I didn't feel anything else. My desires, they changed. My hunger changed. And what's bad is even if I would have went back to the old way, I wouldn't have been satisfied. It would have been bitter. It's kind of like growing up on hot dogs and one day finding a steak. You can't look at that hot dog the same way. If you've had ribeye, you just can't look at it the same way. It don't taste the same. If you've got an option, well, most of the time you're not going to use the hot dog. There may be a few people that can be like, oh, I like the hot dog better. There's always that one. But what I'm saying is the old way don't taste as good as the new way. There's nothing in my life. Man, I, there's things that I was even doing two or three years ago that I don't do anymore. Why? Because they don't fulfill me like what I'm doing now. There's a richness in the glory of Jesus. And I'm telling you, sometimes it comes in layers. It's like, I just dig a little deeper, I get a little more. I dig a little deeper, I get a little more. There's things that maybe even I was watching on TV five years ago that I wouldn't watch now. Maybe things that I wouldn't even listen to that I wouldn't listen to now. Why? Because they don't satisfy me. I found myself driving home, flipping through the radio, thinking, oh, I'd just like to hear one of those good songs, whatever song, and get on the it doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't fulfill me. It actually leaves me more empty than I was before I listened to it. Galatians 3.27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You've taken on a new look. So who do I look like now? I look like my Savior. Randy, would you come this morning with the worship team coming this morning? I'm talking about being in Christ. I'm talking about you can't do it on your own. I'm talking about you can't obey all the laws. You can't obey all the rules. You can't, you can't live this life where you're just like, okay, I just need to not drink, not smoke, not sleep around, not do this, da 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 X is I, if I can just do these things, I'll be the person that Christ wants me to be. And I'm saying, no, it's not like that. I'm saying if you just give me a Christ, you'll be the person that you're supposed to be. You will, you will inhabit the shadow of whatever tree you're standing under. And I'll tell you, you'll eat the fruit of whatever tree you stand under, too. And I want to eat the fruit of the Spirit. Because I want to eat the Spirit. Jesus is saying to those who are weak and struggling this morning, to the ones fighting the same old battles, to the ones who don't have the strength to get past yesterday's mistakes, to the ones who think they can live good enough, talk good enough, to the ones who keep trying to live Christianity as a set of rules to follow, but do not realize that you can live free if you'll just live in Him. He's saying this morning, abide in me. Just live in me. Fall in love with me and the rules will fall into place. But you can't do it on your own. You don't have the power to overcome addiction. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So if something comes my way and I feel like I can't handle it, I remember that. I can do it all. He wouldn't have put me here if I wasn't capable of handling it. And whatever situations come up in your life right now, he wouldn't put you there if he, you couldn't handle it. But you can't handle it on your own. He wants you to handle it through him. And you say, Pastor Matt, well, how do I do it? I live in Christ. I cling so tightly to him that his strength has become my strength. You know what? I may not can lift 300 pounds. I may not can lift 275 pounds. But I bet if Kedra gets on this end and I get on this end, I bet we can pick it up. My strength comes from who I'm connected to. If I'm connected in Jesus, I have everything that he has all. This morning what I'm asking you is, are you living in Christ? Or are you just living here? Do you know Christ or do you know about Christ? Because there's a big difference. And you may not be reaping the life that you thought you would reap in Christianity because you're living near Him and you're knowing about Him. And it's time to start living in Him and start to knowing Him. Fall in love with Him without the expectation of gaining some great wealth in return, but just out of the expectation that I want to love Him more. And see what happens. Let's stand. I'm inviting you to offer this morning for those who say, I want to live in Christ. I want to know Him. I want to love Him. And I want to walk in Him.
Have you ever asked yourself what God's desire for your life is? Not, not what do you know, not what you want to do. Even though you may have great plans, have you ever asked yourself, what does God really want me to do in my life? A lot of times in that answer, it's not, it doesn't come in one big drop from heaven and you automatically know and you feel it and you just go, oh, this is my purpose in life. I'm going to walk out my destiny. No, it comes in this commitment to saying, God, I'll do whatever. God, if, if it's the trash man or if it's the president, I'll do whatever. And God just begins to allow in your life where you're fully satisfied in whatever he's calling you to do. And, and what I'm saying this morning is don't you want to live a life? Don't you want to live a life that says, I want his purpose because I was designed for a square and I'm a square. Or I was designed for a circle and I'm a circle. And I'm tired of trying to fit my square into this circle of life. When God has got something better for me, because every intricate part of me was designed delicately by, delicately by an awesome Savior to fulfill a purpose. And He's got it. It may be simple and it may be complex, but what I know is you're not going to be satisfied until you're doing what God has called you to do. And it may just be simply today, God may be saying, Walk in me. Walk in me. They're going to sing one more time. And I, I'm not for long altar calls. I don't beat the Bible over anybody's head. But what I'm saying is if we don't start walking and discovering the purposes that God has for our life, we're never going to be satisfied. We're never going to be fulfilled. And all that I do here will be in vain. So as they sing, if there's somebody that's going to say, man, I just want to find whatever it is. I just want to get to the place where I can say yes to the Lord and everything. And you may not even be in a place yet where you can say, God, I'll do whatever. But maybe this morning you would say, God, make me vulnerable to where I can start to say whatever. See, today you just got to get to that next step. As they sing this morning, altar is open. God is working in your heart this morning. You respond and you come down. That step of faith will move mountains in your life.
stand now, everybody that's here this morning, anybody, visitors or anyone. And the question that we ask the church is this, is we say, you know what, they're promising to walk with you. They're, they want to be part of this body. They want to be part of what's going on here. Now, we want you to promise that you'll walk with them in love, that you'll join them in unity, that you'll support them, that you'll visit them when they're sick, you'll care for them, you'll pray for the children, you'll pray for their lives, you'll pray for their future. If you will join with them, and you accept them as members this morning and say, I do. I do. And you walk by and you greet our new members this morning and tell them that you love them. Thank you for being here today.